Flying a turboprop means learning a whole new set of engine gauges, and honestly at first they can be pretty confusing. But I'll tell you exactly what I wish someone would have told me by walking you through all phases of an average flight and giving you the practical application for torque, ITT, NP, and percent NG. So I'll just be speaking about my experience in the Kodiak 100 here. So if there are differences in the plane you fly, like obviously take that into consideration. But Starting with the startup sequence, turboprops start a little different than piston engines. You don't really have that sudden turnover moment, but instead it's slowly coming to life. You're just bringing this like sleeping beast to life. So starting a turboprop is kind of like lighting a gas grill or a gas burner in your kitchen. You use igniters to initially light the fuel, but then once it's burning, it keeps itself lit and you don't need the igniters on for most normal operating procedures. So the first step is to engage the igniters and you'll hear them, you hear this kind of click, click, click. It's honestly just like the stove in a funny way. And so the igniters are ready to light the fuel once the fuel is actually there. And then we turn on the auxiliary fuel pump to provide initial fuel pressure before the engine driven pump takes over later. And that makes another sound. Here's what it sounds like. Then we engage the starter. The prop is going to start moving and that amazing sound will start as the engine comes to life. And this is where we start monitoring one of the new engine indications in the turboprop engine. It's percent NG. And NG is your gas generator speed, which references the rotation speed of the compressor section of the engine. It's given as a percentage of the design maximum. So for an example, in the Kodiak 100, 100% NG represents 37,500 RPM it's spinning incredibly fast. And then it uses a gearbox to translate that down into the 2000 or so RPMs in the propeller that we'll actually use. But if they showed NG as a raw number, like 19,500 or something, that would be pretty hard to interpret on the fly, pardon the pun. Uh, so instead they just show it as a percentage. So in this example, 19,500 RPM would just be displayed as 52% NG. But remember that number, 52%, 52% NG, it's gonna come up a few times in this video. But back to the startup sequence. When we engage the starter and the engine starts spinning, we haven't actually introduced any fuel yet because we want the engine to start getting airflow so that once we do introduce and ignite fuel, it won't overheat. So we look to percent NG to make sure it's starting to rise in the startup sequence. And then the Kodiak, uh, you have to wait until you've reached at least 14% NG before you introduce fuel. The igniters are already on. So again, going back to the stove example, it should light once you add fuel. And it's actually really cool. You can hear the sound once fuel gets, gets introduced. It's kind of a poof. And you, and you can, like next time you're on the ramp and you see a King Air starting up or something, like listen, they're gonna start it, they're gonna start, you're gonna run it up, and then you're gonna hear a different sound. You're gonna hear the poof and you know like, oh, there's a lit flame inside of it, which is ugh, just so cool. And once that engine is lit, this is where the next indication comes in. It's ITT, which is inner turbine temperature. It's basically the combustion gas temperature of the engine. It's not actually that, but it's a, it's a pretty close proxy for that. It's basically just showing you how hot the engine is running. That's how you can think of it. So when we introduce fuel in the startup sequence, you wanna make sure that ITT actually starts to rise because that means you have an active lit flame. You don't wanna screw up like I did one time in training where we were in the Kodiak Sim and I was doing a startup, thought we were just gonna go do a normal flight and everything and doing the startup, NG starts coming up and I give it fuel and then I'm just like looking and ITT is just not doing anything. NG is keep, keeps coming up. Uh, but ITT is just, is there's nothing. And I'm like, I don't think I did anything wrong here. I went through my checks and whatever. And so I hear my instructor come over my headset and go, huh, did you check your circuit breakers? And I said, yeah. He goes, did you check all of them? I go, no, not all of them. And he goes, well, you need to do that because the igniters are like on the very bottom. They're very towards the bottom on this whole stack of circuit breakers. And I was just getting in the sim and I kind of run my hand, ran my hand over, but I got lazy and to get all the way down. I'm like, we're in the sim. It's the first fly of the day. It's fine. They're all probably in. But he got in the sim before me and pulled that one, expecting me to do exactly what I did and be lazy and not realize that the igniters wouldn't turn on because the circuit breaker was pulled. So I was introducing fuel, expecting a flame to be lit because the, you know, the igniters would light the fuel, but that's not what happened. So ITT never actually came up. So in this instance, the engine wasn't actually starting and that's called a hung start. Now the opposite can also happen where instead of no ITT, you actually have too much ITT. 
And you wanna make sure ITT doesn't run away and overheat, which would be called a hot start, and that can really damage the engine really quickly. Now in either instance, a, a hung start or a hot start, you just basically abort the startup sequence and figure out what's going on. But in normal operating procedures, like these are rare. It's not like, oh, there's a 50-50 shot. This thing's going to start. You know, what, what am I going to do? It's like, it's probably going to start just fine. But you do need to monitor those things in the startup sequence to make sure you're not getting a hung start or a hot start. Assuming that everything is looking normal, you'll continue engaging the starter until you achieve 52% NG. Remember, I told you to remember that number. It'll come up again later. And at this point, you can disengage the starter and the engine is now fully started and it's running on its own, basically. Now, ITT will rise during this process, like during the start process, and it'll peak, but then eventually decrease and stabilize. So it sounds complicated. It's really not. Here is the startup sequence again without all my commentary, just to show you that it's not as complicated as it sounds. Ready if you are. Yeah, ready. Yeah. After startup, we can push the prop full forward, and this is where NP comes in. And NP just gives you propeller RPM. And if you've flown a constant speed propeller airplane before, you'll be familiar with this concept. But if you'd like to learn more about constant speed propellers, I actually just recently put out a video about this, explaining it in plain English, and I will put that down in the description. So the propeller is in full feather when you start up. So like if I'm the nose of the airplane, it's like parallel to the nose. So it's, it's spinning around like this during the startup sequence. But then once you push the prop full forward, it's going to change the blade angle to more like this, where it's spinning like this, and it's gonna speed up in the process, and you'll hear a very noticeable audible change because the prop is gonna start spinning a lot faster, and it's gonna be generating thrust, and so you can you can hear it, it's cool sound. Uh, and then as you're doing that, NP will start to rise as well. Now once you get to takeoff, there's a few things to monitor here. And a key difference than your piston aircraft is that in your piston aircraft, you can just go full throttle. I mean, you go full throttle at takeoff, you just firewall the thing, and you're not gonna hurt the engine. Like, that's, that's how it's built. But in the Kodiak, you can actually over torque and over temp the engine if you just gave it full power and just rammed the, the power level for, lever forward. So one of the indications you're watching during takeoff is torque. So what is torque in this context? Well, at a high level, torque is basically just a measure of how much twisting force the engine is exerting on the propeller. It's telling you how hard the engine is trying to turn the prop. And it's displayed in foot pounds, which always confused me at first because you're combining a measurement, feet, with weight, pounds, to become foot pounds. It's like, how do those two things go together? But this is what helped make it click for me. If you imagine a one foot lever and you put one pound of pressure on the end of that lever, the resulting twisting motion is one foot pound of torque. It's one foot times one pound, which equals one foot pound. Now if you take that same one foot lever and instead apply two pounds of pressure to it, that would be two foot pounds of torque. It's one foot of leverage times two pounds of pressure. It's two foot pounds. Now if you made the lever two feet long instead of one foot long and you applied two pounds of pressure, you now have four foot pounds of torque. It's two feet of leverage times two pounds of pressure on that leverage equals four foot pounds. It's basically just a combined measure of leverage and force. And in the turboprop engine, foot pounds of torque is just telling you how much twisting force the engine is exerting on that propeller. So as you increase power on takeoff, you wanna make sure to not over torque the engine. Well, why could you over torque the engine? Well, especially when you're at low altitudes uh, or in cold weather or combination of the two, the air is so much thicker. And so you can develop a lot of resistance against that propeller. It's a lot of force that the engine is, is putting on that propeller to turn it through that thick air. So you don't wanna exceed the design limitations for torque. Now, some airplanes do have torque limiters on it or they have FADEC and stuff, which, if you've flown one of those airplanes where you can just kind of firewall the throttle, let me know, I'd love to learn from you down in the comments. But in the Kodiak, you're having to manage it. And in the POH, like there's whole tables for what your torque limitations are for different temperature and altitude combinations. So you can look it up, it's part of your pre-flight. And depending on what avionics you have in the airplane, sometimes those limitations are shown visually, like, like in a green bar. And so that's why you'll hear some people say, oh, just take it to the top of the green, it's below red line, take it to the top of the green, you're fine. But 
again, read your POH. It's, it's going to tell you what to do. So you don't wanna over torque the engine on takeoff, but you also wanna make sure to watch ITT and not over temp the engine. When you're down low, usually you'll run into torque limitations before ITT limitations. But when you're up high, you might run into ITT limitations before torque limitations, because the air is a lot thinner. And so that's why some people say, oh, you temp out before you torque out, or we're temperature limited or we're torque limited. Basically just means which, which one are you limited by given the conditions. And then after takeoff in the climb out, in the Kodiak, we reduced the prop RPM to about 2000, which just helps with efficiency and cabin noise. So NP will come down to 2000. You just pull the prop lever back to do it, just like in a constant speed propeller uh, aircraft that you're used to. And then once you're up in cruise, you just select what RPM you want based on the, P, uh, on the POH. Like for us, we just leave it at 2000 RPM like we were in the climb. It's really, really easy. And then you're just using the power lever to control torque and ITT. Now, usually in cruise, we're temperature limited, so we're just adjusting power to stay under an ITT limitation. So now you're cruising all happy, nice and relaxed until this happens. I will never forget when this happened in Kodiak training. I was in the full motion sim uh, and we're going along. It's an IFR flight, stable, we're in cruise. I'm like, okay, all right, kind of relax. Everything's good. Whap! A very loud thud. And I was like, what the heck was that? And my instructor comes over the headset and he goes, did you just ingest a bird? And, and as I was thinking to myself, I was like, what do you mean did we hit a bird? Like we're sitting on the ground and like in the middle of a simulator. And as I'm having that rebuttal thought, all of a sudden, like my engine quits, crap. And this is when you learn that if it sounds like your engine just quit, your first look, your immediate look is to percent NG. Because if it's falling and it keeps falling and eventually it's going towards zero, yes, the engine stopped. You might have had a flame out, which just simply means the flame in the engine went out, kind of like it would go out on a, on a gas burner or something because of you know disrupted airflow or disrupted fuel flow or severe icing or there's different things that could cause it. But remember how during the startup sequence, I told you to remember 52% NG? This is where it comes back into play. So if the percent NG stabilizes somewhere around 52%, the engine's still running. It's just experienced what's called a rollback where it unintentionally loses power and settles near idle. Now, one of the reasons this can happen is because your power lever has failed. That's out of scope to explain in this video like why it can fail, but the point is it can fail. And if that happens, the engine will roll back to idle. You didn't lose your engine, you just lost your power lever. And in that instance, you can use the mechanical backup for that in the EPL or the emergency power lever, and you can control engine power that way. But in a power loss situation, you first look at percent NG to figure out if the engine actually stopped or if it's still running. Now, if it's a flame out and the engine really quit, depending on what caused it to quit and depending on the situation, you actually might be able to attempt a restart mid-air. Now, once you get into the descent, if you need to pull the power back to not overspeed the aircraft, you just pull the power lever back and that will also decrease torque, ITT, and to a lesser extent, percent NG. And then once you get to the approach phase, you can use your torque to kind of peg power settings, kind of like you would manifold pressure uh, in a 182 or something. So for example, in the Kodiak, I have found that 600 foot pounds is really good for staying in the pattern. Uh, you won't be going too fast and you'll stay nice and level. And then once I'm, I'm descending, about 450 pounds is a perfect target that kind of usually gets me on speed in the descent profile that I want. It's a handy tool. And then once you're on final, you'll go back to full forward on the prop, just like you would in a piston aircraft on final, and NP will go back up. And since your power is pretty pulled back at this point, torque and ITT are both low and you're really not in danger of exceeding limitations here. Of course, unless you're executing a go around, in which case it's back to the kind of uh, takeoff limitations where you really try not to over torque or over temp the engine. Now, once you land and before shutdown, importantly, some turboprops will require that you idle the engine for a certain period of time to allow ITT to cool. And that's probably different than what you've experienced in most non-turbo pistons. So there are a lot of differences flying turboprops versus pistons, and some of them were honestly pretty surprising to me. So if you wanna know those differences, the video on the screen is great for that. It'll help you know what to expect. So I'll see you there.